Thank you. Uh, the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5709 in the name of Christine Graham on Brexit's impact on inflation. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. I call on Christine Graham to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Ms Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Let's start at the very beginning. The EU referendum vote in 2016. The vote across the UK was close, rounded up to 52% voting leave to 48% remain. In Scotland, the figures were 62% remain, 38% leave, and interesting, by way of an aside, Northern Ireland voted 56% remain. In Scotland, every constituency voted remain, including, of course, Scottish Borders and Midlothian. This was in the face of an aggressive and ill-informed campaign, blaming the EU for all ills and promising not just the infamous side of a bus, 350 million a week for the NHS, but being tariff-free, bureaucracy would be cut. But was it? Increased paperwork, for example, truckers need import and export declarations, security declarations and other paperwork for their shipments. New infrastructure at ports to deal with queues and to check loads, vast lorry parks. The trading world was to be our oyster, despite the fact that I believe even Barack Obama said the UK would be at the back of the queue, which is where it is and has stayed. There were no favours waiting for the UK. The one new deal with Australia has infuriated farmers and was even criticised by George Eustace, then the Environment Secretary. The reality is that most British trade is with Europe and Brexit has crippled it. Migration would be under control as the UK courts took back control. More of that later as it impacts on our economy. The UK then cut itself off from its biggest trading partner, the EU, where 40% of its exports went. And for what? Well, the answer is for the highest inflation of the G7 countries, running currently 11% with food inflation at nearly 17%. In terms of how UK inflation compares to other nations, recent analysis from the Financial Times shows that the rate of consumer price inflation, CPI, is higher in the UK than in other devolved economies. It rose to 11.1% in October 2022 in the UK, compared to 10.4% in Germany, 7.7% in the USA, 6.2% in France and 3% in Japan. A member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee noted that Brexit has added 6% to UK food prices and he said that at a recent appearance at the Treasury Select Committee. Yes, Covid had a price tag. The war, in UK, the war in the Ukraine does impact on the UK economy, but Brexit is why it is doing so badly. Even before Brexit, the economy was weak after nearly a decade of Tory government. Add Covid, Ukraine, Trussonomics, and it's a heady mix for failure, bad enough. Yet when you add in the basic ingredient, the Boris Brexit, it explains much more. But don't take my word for it that Brexit has had a devastating impact on the UK economy. The Office for Budget Responsibility predicts the UK will suffer the sharpest decline of any European nation with a drop in growth by 1.4% in 2023. This compares to small independent countries, similar to Scotland, like Ireland, who will see their economies grow by around 3% next year. Can you take an intervention? I can, yes. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you uh, for accepting an intervention. Um, does, the, does the member agree with um, the OBR that Brexit will actually cost the United Kingdom £80 billion this year in lost trade, whereas Richie, Rishi Sunak said in 2016 we would actually be £20 billion a year better off? And does this not call into question the Prime Minister's economic judgment? Christine Gray? I do indeed accept that. And the OBR has also said that Brexit's impact on the economy is now adverse, in quotes, over the medium term to tune of 4% of GDP. This is massive self-harm. Not a week passes without cries of protest from traders, truckers, farmers, hoteliers, care homes, scientists and even performing artists. Trade bureaucracy has soared. Every exported cow needs a vet certificate. Unskilled labour has dried up all impacting on the UK economy. 
Now public opinion has swung dramatically against Brexit, with just 32% still in favour and 56% regretting leaving. Rumblings in the Tory ranks about Swiss-style deals, mutterings from the CBI about the need for changes to rules for migrants to work here. And you know that even the Tories wedded to the ideology of Brexit and Rishi Sunak is right up there, can no longer, no longer delude us that Brexit is just the ticket. But Rishi has to keep his party together and foremost especially the uber Brexiteers, including himself, and to pop with the rest of us. The Bank of England in their November Monetary Policy Report, while saying that the major contributor to current levels of inflation is the global increase in gas and therefore energy prices, it also highlights the impact of non-energy tradable good prices. These are partly driven by global factors such as the bottlenecks in international supply chains since the pandemic, disruption linked to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also costs associated with Brexit. To quote from The Guardian, to state the obvious, the war in Ukraine and pandemic-related supply issues are sending prices soaring across the world. But what gives Britain a particularly pronounced problem, which forecasters say will endure into the immediate future, while inflation in the Eurozone starts to fall, is Brexit. Our departure from the EU has weakened the pound, increasing the prices of imports, adding to companies' costs. Post-Brexit limitations in foreign workers are also hitting firms' bottom lines, are as, problems, as are problems with the UK-European supply chains, close quotes. Adam Poston, the American economist and former member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, said that 80% of the explanation for British, Britain's higher inflation was bound up with Brexit and its endless complexities. It amounted, he said, and I quote, to a trade war the UK declared on itself. So, while living standards are under immense pressure around the globe this year due to record inflation, particularly in food and energy prices, the officials said Britain would suffer more as a direct result of leaving the EU. More bad news, even before the economic disaster there was trust. Between 2016 and 2021, it is estimated that Brexit cost the UK 31 billion, the equivalent for Scotland is 2.5 billion. For Scottish Borders Council, that's 53 million, and for Midlothian, 43 million. Keir Starmer's no help. Battered by his past flip-flops on the subject, rejecting any easing for a single market is not in line with public opinion, neither are Lib Dems. For them all, Brexit is done and dusted, and we must make what we can of it. We were told in 2014 that a vote yes for independence would see us thrown out of the EU. Ironic, isn't it, that we were dragged out, despite 62% voting remain, and by a party which today only holds six Scottish seats. That lie won't fly again. Already, support for independence is on the rise as the Scottish people see the inadequacies of UK economic policies. Tomorrow, we will learn of the Supreme Court judgment. However that goes, I know that sooner rather than later, Scotland will regain its independence. Brexit was the final straw. Thank you, Ms Graham. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Edward Mountain. Around four minutes, please, Mr McMillan. Great. No, thank you very much, President. Also, first of all, I, I may have to leave just prior to 6pm as I'm chairing a cross-party group later. I'd also like to congratulate uh, Christine Graham for securing this important debate, highlighting, highlighting the catastrophe that Brexit has brought upon her Midlothian, South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale constituency. And as our motion indicates, the Brexit shambles has also affected elsewhere in Scotland, and that's obviously where I will focus my comments. Nobody with any credibility can state that Brexit has been positive. So-called Brexit opportunities have withered on the vine, and the false dawn of a trade deal with the US, much heralded by the former, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, to the admission by the former Prime Minister Liz Truss that a deal will be years away as negotiations are not even taking place, proves that the Tories' Brexit crusade has left people in Ms Graham's constituency and my own Guinea Canaveral constituency worse off. I voted Remain, and I would do so again tomorrow. I look forward to the day that we in Scotland can rejoin the EU as an equal partner when we do secure our independence from Westminster. 
The economic climate that Scotland faces at the moment is driven by a variety of factors, and that is undeniable. But once again, what no one with any credibility can deny is that Brexit has been a major contributing factor to rising costs, rising inflation, and also a reduction in opportunity. The Trust Quarteng shambolic budget has also played a huge factor in the current economic crisis, leading to the, the extension of the cuts agenda that we saw last week from the current Chancellor. And the filling of the budget black hole is going to lead to yet more austerity, families struggling, kids going hungry, and food banks facing unprecedented demand. But some in the Chamber will argue that inflation is high elsewhere, so the, the cost of living crisis is not solely down to the Tories and the UK Government. Saying also, the Financial Times reported that the CPI rate of inflation in the UK is higher than in any other developed country, at 11.1%, Germany is at 10.4%, the US is 7.7%, France 6.2%, to provide just some other examples. The fact that a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee has stated on the record to the Treasury State Committee in Westminster that Brexit has added a whopping 6% to the cost of food in the UK tells a story. Even worse presenting officer, a former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, Adam Posen, suggested earlier this year that Brexit was responsible for up to 80% of the increase to prices in the UK. Now that truly, truly, sorry, that truly was a remarkable statement that once again highlighted the folly of a Brexit Scotland didn't vote for and how the right-wingers of the Tory party have led to a level of poverty many of my constituents, and no doubt others across this chamber, haven't suffered from before. Saying also, decisions by politicians matter. Policy decisions and legislation that politicians and governments progress have a real-life effect upon our constituents. Uh, I'm just, uh, I don't have much time, so I'm sorry. And that's why the complete disregard the UK government it had when pursuing Brexit legislation through the Westminster Parliament, ignoring legitimate concerns from many across the political spectrum, but also from those with no political allegiance, has led to the situation that we face. No matter how many cost of living surgeries I do in my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, I know that I will just be scratching the surface of the support that my community needs and also deserves. Now, the Tory obsession with Brexit is increasing poverty, and the fact that both Labour and the Lib Dems, who I acknowledge there is only one Labour member in the Chamber today and there is no Lib Dems, the fact that both Labour and the Lib Dems would not reverse Brexit speaks volumes about them and how thrilled they are to be part of a Westminster system that helps the richest and punishes the poorest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Around four minutes, please, Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, during this session, Christine Graham has used members' debates to highlight non-overtly political issues, such as the Men's Sheds movement and the Miners' Workers' Pension Scheme. And we've seen other follow, uh, MSPs follow the same convention with debates such as Gas Safety Week and Cancer Card Initiative. Sadly, Presiding Officer, this motion does not follow that recipe. It is overtly political and I believe goes against the unwritten conventions of the Parliament, and that disappoints me, Presiding Officer, and I believe is unworthy of Ms Graham. Uh, Presiding... Mr Mountain, sorry, would you resume your seat just for a wee second, if you don't mind, to resume sorry. your seat? Today. It was just to point out that the procedure for the selection of members' business is, is uh, well known to members, uh, and that is what the, the decision was. I don't know if the member's calling others into question. Hopefully not. That was the business motion that was selected according to due process. I would just point that out for the member to reflect on. Please resume, Mr Mountain. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and let me say that I've never been one to stray away from the subject of a debate. So I'm going to address some of the issues that Christine Graham has raised. Now, Christine Graham makes much... And by the way, if there are um, people who want to intervene, Presiding Officer, providing you let me have the time back, I'm very happy to let them intervene. Now, Christine... Graham makes much about this Parliament responding and respecting democracy, and I agree with her, and I'll always defend democracy, but it cannot be on the basis of agreement when it seats her views only. In her motion, she states that the solution to the issues she highlights are twofold. 
becoming independent and, re and sorry, joining the EU. Now, the voice of democracy spoke in 2014 and again in 2016, and the answers were indeed clear. No to independence and yes to Brexit. Now, as a de Democrat, I respect both of those results, and I believe every parliamentarian should too. Sadly, however, it appears that because Ms Graham didn't get the answers she wants, she wants to rerun the debate and the vote. And let's be clear, ever since the votes and the decisions of the, the majority have been made... Sorry, was there an intervention? Can I take... Have I got time? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Christine Graham. Uh, yeah, thank you. I apologise for not taking in mind. I actually cut my speech considerably. Will the member, I respect what he's saying, address the issue, which is, has Brexit contributed to high inflation across the UK? Edward Mountain. Indeed I will, and uh, I, I will keep my uh, speech short uh, and to the point. So, specifically on the European Union, I think that most people will accept that forging a new relationship with the EU and other countries would, after 47 years of membership, be challenging, and it has been. However, the suggestion of separating from a 300-year-old union would be easier is pure hot air. We have seen flimsy pamphlets produced to support this argument. What they haven't done is deal effectively with the issues and specifically fiscal issues such as, such as currency, pension issues, national debt to mention but a few. You cannot gloss over these or play fast and loose with answers in the hope that no one notices. They will see through you, they have seen through you and your fantasy economics will not pay the mortgage. And what about the border that you'll create with our biggest trading partner, if you were, God forbid, to get independence and join the EU. The First Minister has said that it would lead to a border crossing point, which no business welcomes. Indeed, I'm sad that the member who I'm about to mention has already left, but the only person that seems to welcome border crossing points is Emma Harper. Goodness knows why. Perhaps she wants to establish a bureau de chance. We are better together. Take the pandemic, for example. Uh, the figures speak for themselves. Scotland received £14.4 in barn consequentials from the UK Treasury. And on top of that, hundreds of thousands of Scottish jobs were saved through the furlough scheme. Yeah. In Christine Graham's constituency alone, which both reaches into Midlothians and the border councils, nearly 40, sorry, 34,000 jobs were saved. Yeah. And now... no. Uh, if I can just finish this point, and then if I get the time back, presiding officer, I'm happy to. And even during this energy and inflation crisis brought about by Putin's illegal war in Ukraine, the UK continues to step up and provide support to Scotland with the energy price guarantee and an extra £1.5 in funding in, announced in last week's autumn statement. I, I, I can give you up to six minutes speaking time reflecting okay. the interventions. Clear Adams. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you, Mr. Mountain, for taking the intervention. Can he recognise that last week the Paris Stock Exchange overtook the London Stock Exchange in terms of financial trading in the U European Union and that Brexit has been an utter disaster financially and people can't pay their mortgages right now? Edward Mountain. Uh, presiding officer, I would answer that question if I had more time, but I don't, so I'm going to continue along the line. And it's not in the motion, as you'll well know. So turning to the cost of food, for which uh, Christine Graham suggests is due to Brexit, as a food producer, and I refer you to my member of interest, I can tell you the following. Fertiliser has gone up by 450%. Sprays have gone up by 30%. Tractor fuel has doubled. Electricity has almost doubled. The result for wheat is, for example, which is a basic staple for human uh, food construction and animal feed, has gone from £200 a tonne to £290 a tonne and might well be trading post-Christmas at £320 a tonne. None of this is due to Brexit. All of those increases are down to Putin's illegal war. Presiding officer, Pursuing another divisive independence referendum is not the answer to today's problems. The impacts of war and inflation and the resultant energy crisis are not just local to Scotland or the United Kingdom. They are global challenges and are better addressed with Scotland remaining part of the strong United Kingdom that it's in in the moment. Thank you, President.
Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call on Faisal Chowdhury. Around four minutes, please. And Mr Chowdhury will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Mr Chowdhury. Thank, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to thank Christian Graham for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. Christian Graham's motion mentions the scenic and beautiful area of Midlothian South, Tudel and Lauderdale. But, but Brexit poses challenges in Midlothian North, across Lothian and across Scotland. So there is much to agree with in the motion being discussed. But it will not surprise Christian Graham that I cannot support its conclusion. Last week, in the debate on the Constitution Europe External Affairs uh, and Cultural Committee report, my colleague Sarah Boyack said, many of us did not want to be here, dealing with the consequences of the UK's departure from the EU. And she is right. But Brexit and the levels of inflation being faced today lie squarely at the door of the Tories. The EU referendum was a political choice by David Cameron to try to unite his party. The Brexit deal was firstly negotiated by Theresa May and voted against by Boris Johnson, uh, only for Boris Johnson to renegotiate parts of the deal. The former Prime Minister described it as an open ready deal, only for him and now his two Tory successor to seek to unliterally change that very deal through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Now the Tory party are very keen to point out that there are inf inflationary pressure everywhere, which is true to an extent. But the UK finds itself in a far worse position than many comparable countries because of two factors the recent political instability and the fact that the Tory party is held hostage by an internal uh, faction which will only accept the most extreme form of Brexit. But I think many across the United Kingdom are tired of government by internal Tory, uh, Tory drama. We need a Labour government in Westminster to provide solid leadership and move the UK forward. So I cannot accept the conclusion of the motion that independent is the answer to this problem. As Mark Blythe, one of the economists appointed to the First Minister's own panel of advisors, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just go ahead. Uh, advisor has said independence would be Brexit times 10. Uh, the answer to the disruption caused by separation from our biggest trading partners is not uh, to repeat the process. It is a change of direction in Westminster with a new constructive attitude to our friends on the continent and a, a commitment to revitalizing our economy. Only by doing this will we deliver an economy that works for everyone across the UK. This better future is possible, and I want to see it for Christian Graham's constituency just as much as for the Lothian region and the rest of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. And I now call on Tom Arthur, Minister, to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking Christine Graham for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, I, I think I, I recall that we uh, debated Brexit many times in the last session, and it strikes me that so much of what we said then has come to pass. And I think this debate, amongst reminding us of what we said then, it also serves the useful purpose of puncturing the conspiracy of silence which seems to have taken hold in many quarters with regards to the material impact that Brexit is happening in concert with other factors that is impacting upon our economy and indeed our way of life. Presiding officer, we did warn repeatedly and we did so emphatically that Brexit and particularly the variety of Brexit, the hard Brexit imposed by Westminster 
would cause huge damage to Scotland's economy. To add to the harm caused economically, socially and culturally from the loss of Horizon, Erasmus, free movement and also environmentally with plans now to remove high EU standards from our statute books. In presiding office, it wasn't just the Scottish Government at saying so and it is not just the Scottish Government saying so now. Sadly, this is reaffirmed by the sort of statistics in Christine Graham's motion and reported almost weekly with each new economic forecast or trade statistic. Recently, the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, linked the current financial predicament to Brexit. And Mark Kearney, a former Governor of the Bank of England, believes that Brexit acts as a break on economic growth and increases the rate of inflation. The UK's rate of inflation hit a 41-year high in October, accelerating to 11.1 per cent. The sharp rise, sharp rise was caused by higher gas, electricity and food prices. Annual food price inflation rocketed to 16.5 per cent, the highest for 45 years. These figures mask a, a bleak reality. They mean hardship for more individuals, families, businesses and communities. And the people paying the highest price for this are those on the lowest income. The people paying the highest price for Brexit are those on the lowest incomes, despite Scotland voting to remain. And I really recognise that there are other factors, but Brexit is a significant contributory factor. And of all the factors that we face just now, it is the one that was the result of a clear political choice by a government in these islands. The Office for Budget Responsibility has forecast that UK GDP will be cut by 4% as a result of Brexit. And the Financial Times reported £100 billion of lost output and £40 billion in less revenue for the Treasury each year. Brexit is contributing to fueling inflation and is making Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK poorer. As a consequence of Brexit, the UK is facing a worse cost of living crisis than it otherwise would be, partly due to the loss of free trade. Analysis in April from the London School of Economics showed that post-Brexit trade barriers resulted in a 6% increase in food prices in the UK. And a report by the Resolution Foundation in June... Certainly. Edward Mountain. Uh, I, I thank Mr Arthur for giving way. I mean, as a food producer, I know that the majority of costs actually come down to the cost of fuel because that underpins all costs of production. It's not actually down to Brexit. Will you accept that fuel prices drive food prices? And if so, everyone will gain to affect it. And I, and I suspect others will be catching up across Europe shortly. Minister. I have not said in my remarks that Brexit is the sole cause of the situation we face. I recognise that. And I recognise that inflation across the economy is going to ultimately be a reflection of energy price inflation. That is just a, a, a reality we can, and an economic fact we can all accept. But the point I am making, and these are independent statistics, that Brexit has had a contributory factor. And a report by the Resolution Foundation in June found that even before the UK left the EU, Currency depreciation linked to Brexit increased the cost of living in the UK by £870 per year for the average household. And the trade barriers we now have are causing real harm. The OBR now expects trade volumes to decline over the medium term, falling to 8.3% below present levels in the final quarter of next year. And the food and drink sector in Scotland has borne the brunt of this hard Brexit import imposed by Westminster on Scotland. Exports to the EU in key food products have fallen by 52% in fruit and vegetables and 25% in exports of dairy and eggs in the first half of 2022, compared to the same period in 2019. Scottish businesses have seen record increases in input prices in 2022 and cite Brexit as a factor, according to S&P Global Statistics. And this is fed through to the 21st uh, monthly rise in prices charged by businesses as of July. Brexit has ended free trade and also free movement, hurting key Scottish industries and contributing and creating labour shortages. It is now more expensive and time-consuming for employers to recruit from overseas and for people who want to come to Scotland to live and work. Food processing and manufacturing, 
Hospitality and agriculture are particularly affected, harming rural Scotland in particular. As of July 2022, a range of key economic sectors in Scotland were experiencing worker shortages, for example, 43.4% in construction and 43.8% in accommodation and food. But that economic harm is also a social harm. We are poorer as a result of Brexit and we risk missing out on the cultural benefits of having more people from, of working age from a range of backgrounds and contributing to our common weal. President Officer, we are doing everything we can within our limited powers to support people and businesses. And by the end of March next year, we will have invested around £3 billion in a range of measures to support households. This includes supporting energy bills, childcare, health and travel, as well as social security payments that are either not available elsewhere in the UK or are more generous. For businesses, we have an existing package of non-domestic uh, rates relief worth over £800 million, which includes the UK's most generous small business bonus scheme. But we are doing all this with, I don't just say one, but at times it feels like two hands tied behind our back. Inflation is eating away at the Scottish budget, which has already fallen by 10% in real terms between this year and last. And due to the lack of additional funding in 2022-23 and the financial restrictions of devolution, we have had no choice but to make savings of over £1 billion. And the announcements in last week's UK autumn statement do very little to address the damage this has done to the Scottish budget. Presiding officer, I recognise that we face a series of global challenges and that the situation we find ourselves in here today uh, lends itself to no easy solutions. But what I would recognise is that many of the issues that we have, Brexit can be cited as a contributory factor. Brexit was ultimately a political choice. Now, I dispute anyone who would wish to argue uh, that it has democratic legitimacy in Scotland. Scotland comprehensively rejected Brexit in 2016, and every election since then, to this Parliament and to Westminster, parties opposed to Brexit have been overwhelmingly returned. But there's another reality, presiding officer, and is, it, is this as well. The hard Brexit that we have had inflicted upon us was not a necessity. There was a moment in June, July and August of 2016, when the UK government could have listened, they could have engaged, they could have heeded the warnings of this government, of this parliament and many other stakeholders and sought to pursue an arrangement with the European Union that would minimise damage. But rather than focusing on what was best for the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom government focused on what they thought was best for the Conservative Party. And unfortunately, and as a consequence of that, we are all paying the price today. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.